Bernard, thank you so much for the, for the flattering introduction. I'll try to live up to my billing here. I'm particularly grateful for an introduction that I was capable of understanding, I must say. I, I come to this ancient university on this happy day as a visitor from the new world. And I begin in the spirit of the day by bringing greetings and congratulations. Hail to your ancient university from my young and green one. Hurrah for the new graduates of the Faculty of Law. May we all wish them prosperous careers and contented home lives. Congratulations, too, to the families, loved ones, and friends who have supported them through their years of study. But as a visitor from the New World, I cannot be content simply with delivering greetings and congratulations. I must also bring warnings and lamentations. Uh, you, today's new graduates in Leuven, join a venerable and honorable profession which has given the Western world the immense gift of the rule of law, but in my new world, the rule of law is in serious danger. I stand before you at an unquiet time in the history of the United States. It is not certain how well the values of decency and respect for the law that all of us present today share can survive in my new world country. As I look out on the newest European members of the lawyer's trade, I cannot keep my American fears to myself. I will make this address a plea to all of you to remain faithful to the rule of law here in the old world. That is the theme of my address today. It is a plea from the new world to the old. It would darken the day too much, though, if I spent all of my time speaking of crises of the rule of law. Let me begin with a less fearful topic. I start with some observations on your lives as old world lawyers and how they differ from the lives of new world lawyers. This, your commencement day, is a moment for you to reminisce about your years of study, but perhaps even more so it is, I imagine, a moment when your thoughts turn to the future. In part, this involves thoughts about your future employment. You have your eyes, I am sure, on securing successful and remunerative jobs. But jobs cannot be your only concern. I imagine that you, are also, that you also have your eyes on building a happy private life. This is a moment, after all, when you leave behind your student existence. I hope that student existence has been a rich and pleasant experience. But of course, there are many comforts and pleasures that no student can aspire to. You can now look forward to the greater grat gratification of a fully adult life. New World lawyers have the same concerns. In these respects, you are no different from the new graduates of my young university, whose commencement took place six weeks ago. They, too, are hoping for good jobs and fulfillment in their private lives. But I believe the old world offers you opportunities for a different and perhaps better future than the future that awaits the new graduates of Yale. And in contrasting the old world with the new, I would like to begin there. Enjoying both good jobs and fulfilling private lives has become difficult in the United States. The new graduates of the Yale Law School are joining an American legal profession that puts intense and sometimes inhumane demands on young lawyers. Most of my students will join large law firms in New York and Washington, D.C. They will receive handsome salaries, but they will be asked to work brutally long hours, not infrequently all night. Some of them will rarely see their own homes for days on end. They will be granted astoundingly little vacation time, as measured by European standards. Many of the firms in which they work will be barren of the basic norms of civility and decency that govern European workplaces. There are few American bans on mobbing or moral harassment. And everyday law firm life reflects that fact. Big American law firms are all too often places where lawyers routinely scream insults at their opponents their colleagues, and their assistants. The pressures of work in these firms will tell on the private lives of my students. It is a sad truth that in some cases their marriages or other relationships will suffer. My students are also joining an American legal profession in which the professional and ethical values that characterize the law in the old world are comparatively weaker. American adversary lawyers are trained to hunt for tricks and stratagems. To take only one example that is sure to shock my European audience, American lawyers meet regularly with witnesses outside court 
in order to supply them with suggested testimony. This witness coaching, as we call it, is a routine part of American practice, and it inevitably undermines any hope that lawyers might feel themselves to be officers of justice and truth. Many more examples can be given. You are especially likely to experience the American style of legal practice in contract negotiations in which you will encounter aggressive and opportunistic American lawyers who will sometimes seem disturbingly lacking in candor. Of course, the lawyers who work in this American profession can grow very rich. And many of them hold themselves to high ethical standards, of course. But too often, American lawyers conduct themselves as members of a rapacious gang. They generally obey the ethical standards imposed on the profession, of course. I certainly hope that all my students do. But the ethical standards imposed on American lawyers demand far less than those imposed on European ones. That means that American lawyers experience less of the gratification that comes with living an upstanding and ethical professional life. This comparison between the new world and the old leads to the first plea that I make to you today. Remain faithful to the old world values that sustain the old world form of legal practice. For I would really like to believe, as a visitor from the new world, that things are different here. Perhaps I romanticize the old world, but I hope not. The difference, as I perceive it, is not just a difference in the norms of legal practice. It is a difference in the ethic of life. Enjoying both a good job and a fulfilling private life is not easy anywhere, but it is, one hopes, still more possible here than it is in the United States. The gratifications of being an officer of justice and truth are more available to you than they are to your American counterparts. In speaking of this old world ethic uh, in here in Flanders, I cannot resist invoking a shining name in the history of Leuven, Justus Lipsius. Lipsius, as I am sure you know, was the philosopher of negotium and otium, of labor and leisure, of arbeit and unspanning. He tells us that a life well lived is a life that makes room both for a responsible, ethical, and productive employment and for devotion to family and contemplation. Perhaps Renaissance philosophy seems distant today. As you take your leave of Leuven, you may be ready to forget Justus Lipsius, but as a lawyer from a new world country where it has become painfully difficult to work and live honorably, I hope not. And I hope that it is not out of place for me to say that these Flemish traditions help us to understand how there can be a better legal profession than the American legal profession and a saner and healthier future for the graduates of Leuven. No one here can expect to live the sort of life that Lipsius lived but my acquaintance with European lawyers suggests that there is still room to live a balanced life of negotium and otium of a kind that will be denied to too many of my American students. I know that American law may sometimes seem tempting. Perhaps you will never partake in the spoils of a rapacious legal practice, but both your negotium and your otium, your arbeit and your unspanning can be richer for that, and it is with a little bit of envy that this New World visitor congratulates you, new lawyers of the old world. It is also with some envy and more anxiety that I turn now to the crisis of rule of law in my country. The United States, as you will know, is living through disturbing times now. That may not seem a suitable topic for a happy commencement day in Flanders, but the crisis has come to the United States for many of the same reasons that my Yale students face so many risks of an unhappy future. The same values or absence of values that have given the rapacious practice of law, given us the rise, sorry, to the rapacious practice of law in the United States have contributed to the erosion of the rule of law that we have witnessed over the past year and a half. When I plead with you to remain faithful to old world values, therefore, I am not only pleading with you to seek balance between negotium and otium in your pursuit of personal happiness, I am pleading with you to remain stalwart in the defense of the law at a moment when societies on both sides of the Atlantic, but especially on my side, are in grave danger. The weakness of the rule of law in the United States has become frighteningly apparent over the last several months. A dangerous, 
And if I may say it, possibly mentally ill man has entered the White House. He is a man who has no comprehension of the law and nothing but disdain for it. He has defied all restraints and he poses a grave threat to the welfare of the entire globe. He has been abetted by a cowardly class of politicians and he is making a sustained effort to take control of the American judiciary. You may be tempted to think that this is all the result of one disastrous election and tempted to hope that another election might put America right. That would be a mistake. The weakness of the American rule of law is much older than 2016. It has to do with failings in American legal culture that stretch back at least two centuries. That is why, standing before you in the old world, I come with lamentations and warnings. My country is suffering the consequences of a failure of the law. Do not follow us down the same path. Some of the weaknesses in American law are the same weaknesses that have created the grasping and opportunistic American profession of which I have just spoken. American culture has a deep-seated tendency to regard the law as a means rather than an end. The law is treated not as a body of rules essential to the maintenance of civilization, but as a weapon to de be deployed strategically in battle. There is no better example of this than the business career of Mr. Trump himself. He is a man notorious for threatening and filing meritless lawsuits. His strategy for many years has been to intimidate his opponents by inflicting crippling lit litigation costs on them. None of this would be possible in the old world where the law does not permit itself to be so easily exploited. Mr. Trump is also a man notorious for exploiting American bankruptcy law in order to cheat his creditors, contractors, and workers. Again, none of this would be possible in the old world. The man in the White House who threatens all of us in Europe as well as in America is in these ways a creation of American law, the product of a profoundly flawed legal order. If the legal values of the old world prevailed in the United States, Donald Trump would be nothing more than a failed rich kid, nothing more than an unprincipled egotist who had squandered the fortune into which he was born. A legal system like the European legal system you are joining would have exposed him as a con man from the beginning, and in that sense, it would have safeguarded the rule of law. But of course, the threat to the rule of law represented by Trump extends far beyond his business career. The election of 2016 gave him the opportunity to do infinitely greater damage than he could do as a New York real estate mogul. But here again, we must understand that as president, he is exploiting weaknesses in the American legal tradition that long predate 2016. Most of those weaknesses grow out of a fundamental feature of the American legal order. The American tradition does not erect the sort of barrier between law and politics that the law of the old world erects. Law students in the old world are trained to respect a basic distinction between reasoning de lege ferenda and reasoning de lege lata. The first is the province of the political process charged with making policies. The second is the province of lawyers charged with carrying out those policies effectively but within the limits of the law. It is respect for this fundamental distinction that enables members of the legal profession to serve as the guardians of the rule of law in a democracy. They take their orders from the representatives of the people as they must but they are also the representatives of the law. And it is never their job simply to obey. The fundamental distinction between politics and law has not always been observed in Europe. It broke down disastrously in the era of fascism and Nazism, as all of us here know. And we can all sense the danger that it might break down again, especially in Eastern Europe. But commitment to it runs deep in Western Europe, and there is good hope that it will hold firm. American law, by contrast, makes no such distinction. Indeed, my students at Yale are baffled when I describe it. One consequence is that American legal education differs starkly 
from European legal education. Some of you may have spent time in an American law school and experienced the difference. In American seminar rooms and lecture halls, discussions about the law are typically discussions of what we call policy. Policy arguments are quite simply arguments de lege ferenda. The fact that we engage in such arguments may make American, may make American teaching more entertaining than European teaching. Everybody enjoys a good policy debate, but I fear that it helps produce a class of lawyers who are poorly equipped to maintain the ethical and intellectual independence of the Guild. Our constant talk of policy instills comparatively little of the lawyerly ethos that you've absorbed here in Leuven of the sense of the necessary independence of the law. We never absorb the same sense that there is a province of the law that must be governed by rules different from the gut rules that govern the province of politics. This absence of a sharp divide between law and politics does not only color American legal education, the same pattern holds in American government. And we have seen the consequences during these last disturbing months. Just as American law schools do not make a distinction between reasoning de lege lata and reasoning de lege ferenda, American government does not make a distinction between law and politics. The most dramatic example and the one of the greatest current urgency involves the judiciary. Those of you who become European judges will join a branch of the profession designed to embody and protect the rule of law. You will be recruited on the basis of your gifts and diligence as a lawyer. You will ascend slowly through the ranks of the judiciary as you master the skills of a judge, the most critical skills for the maintenance of the rule of law and build the resources of character necessary for the challenges of the negotium of honorable judging. Nothing like that goes on in the United States. The American judiciary is ruled by politics. In the vast majority of American states, judges are elected officials. And they are elected after campaigns that cost large sums, sometimes running into the millions of dollars, and that involve large-scale political advertising. It goes without saying that these judicial candidates often raise campaign funds from the very parties that will appear before them. On the federal level, judges are not elected, but they are chosen on the basis of their political beliefs. Indeed, one of the most significant developments on the contemporary American scene is the concerted effort of the Trump administration to take control of the judiciary branch for the Republican Party. Mr. Trump's support among many of his voters rests on his commitment to this goal. This toxic politicization of the judiciary is utterly alien to the values of the old world. Indeed, only a few months ago, the European Commission declared such politicization to be a manifest violation of the rule of law in the case of Poland. I quote, over a period of two years, the Polish authorities have adopted more than 13 laws affecting the entire structure of the justice system in Poland impacting the Constitutional tri Tribunal, Supreme Court, ordinary courts, National Council for the Judiciary, and so on, the common pattern is that the executive and legislative branches have been systematically enabled to politically interfere in the composition, powers, administration, and functioning of the judicial branch, de nobis in the United States, fabula naratur. The European Commission, without mentioning my country, has condemned us for lacking rule of law, and rightly so. All of this makes me a fearful visitor from the New World. I plead with you today to stand with the European Commission. The stakes are high, and what is happening in the United States, let me emphasize, is not simply the result of one aberrant election in 2016. It reflects a failure of the rule of law that dates back at least to the 1790s. I know that you may not wish to think about crises of the rule of law on this commencement day, and I can only hope that you forgive me for raising alarms, but you enter the legal profession at a perilous time for all of us, and I cannot stand before you without voicing my lamentations and my warnings. Much more could be said. The politicization of American law does not end with the judiciary. There are many examples among which the scandalous state of American criminal justice is perhaps the most important, and I am sure you know that I have hardly exhausted the tale of the dangers that the Trump administration presents but I think I have asked you to listen to lamentations and warnings for long enough. So let me close with the wish that there be no more crises of the rule of law. 
May you have happy and fulfilling careers as lawyers who need never worry about anything but the honorable pursuit of personal happiness. May you lead untroubled lives in untroubled days. My warmest congratulations. Thank you.